So tell me about your book, why this felt like the perfect time to relive those memories. Well, I'd thought about this book on and off for a long time, and I think my big problem or the shortcoming of the book that I always saw was that the book was too small. I never thought I really had enough to tell. And then I realized that what I needed to do was interview everyone involved with the movie. Because that way, first of all, the book would be much broader because I could talk about those things that I wasn't there for, but I would still have firsthand accounts of those. And the book would be deeper in that even for those things that I remember, I have other other memories of it, other people's versions or takes on it. And I felt that would really improve the book and just make it more substantial. Plus, I decided I wanted to talk about more than just the um, ju- than just the the shooting of the film. That I, but in talking, you know, that in talking about um, the aftermath, the the public reception and the critical reception of, to the book, and the, what that meant about critics and the public, and ultimately how that perception evolved. And you know where Chainsaw fits in. But if I if I if I talked about those things too, then I would have a book that would actually be interesting to a broad audience. So it took thinking about that before I realized that's a book I could do. And then I think as as members of the cast and crew died, I thought if I'm going to do this book, I got to do it now. So that's why I did it. You know what always fascinates me are are those occasions where you know you you set out you probably thought this was this was a little film it was a little film you probably had very little um thought in your head that it would become a cultural phenomenon uh how does that when did you first realize it had become that phenomenon and and how did it feel to to be a part of it did it kind of redefine the experience at all for you well it's funny because you're right i i really didn't know what to expect and I thought about it when we were filming and immediately after, you know, what, how do I measure this movie? What has to happen for it to be a success in my mind? And I really, the biggest dream I could imagine for this book, for this movie would be that five years down the road, there'd be a few hardcore fans that remembered it. So yes, it was a huge shock when it, when I realized it was so big and I really didn't, realize what this movie was becoming for a long time because I I left Texas the year after Chainsaw came out and uh, moved to New England where I didn't even watch TV for many, many years. And it was really when I went out to L.A. in 1987 and was working on a movie out there because I had been turning movies down. And I went out there and worked on a movie and one of the one of the uh, actresses came up to me on the second day of shooting and said, gee, you're actually a nice guy. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, your role is so famous and the movie's so big, I, I just figured you'd be a jerk. And that's mm-hmm. when I realized that the movie was big and that no one on the set had talked to me the first day. And so that was really the beginning. And then soon after that, or a couple of years after that, I saw an episode of Cheers in which uh, Re- Rebecca, the, the Kirstie Alley character, uh is out on a big house by herself. And the last line of the show is, oh, Leatherface, I hope that's not you. And I think that was the clincher because I realized that the movie and the character had become so much part of the culture that she didn't have to explain to anybody mm-hmm. who he was. Mm-hmm. And that that really was when I saw how big how big it had become and how it had really entered the culture. As far as its effect on me, I don't think it changed my perspective on the movie because I'd always been very aware of how miserably difficult it was. And also, I had always been very pleased with what we'd ended up with because just watching the movie the first time I saw it back in 74, it it seemed so much better than I could have dreamed that it would be. I mean, I still didn't imagine it would be huge, but I I liked the movie. So, So... my perception of the movie and the experience really never changed when I when I when I realized that it becomes so big. I think what changed was um, my my shock. I guess I have to put it. I mean, you know, uh, my 
I think it was a very, um, I don't even know how to say this. I was thrilled that the movie had been that big, you know, became that big. Yeah. And I was delighted that I was lucky enough to be part of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, more than just uh, the success of being seen so much over the years, it's become a cultural landmark. I mean, it's 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 in the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Leatherface is common vernacular. Um, you know, and, and what interests me is why you think it hit the zeitgeist, because we're used to now so many films that – that followed Chainsaw being so uh, owing a lot to the influence of that film, but but what was groundbreaking about it in in '74 when it came out? Well, I think you know there had been a couple of movies that were groundbreaking not very long before it, you know, and and what was it '61? There was Psycho, and Psycho really broke some rules. The main character died halfway through the movie, um, and 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 the main character wasn't heroic. I mean, she was stealing money, you know. And then there was Night of the Living Dead, which also had a very dark vision and I think was groundbreaking. So, you know, there were a couple of movies be- before, but and certainly Chainsaw was one of those movies that just changed some of the rules. I think in Chainsaw's case, first of all, the movie was so realistic, and I think that was very new with horror movies. Uh, you know, it was not an expressionist Mare Nile movie, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. this you felt like you were watching, and I think that was, I mean, that you were in on it, and I think that was a very new thing. Um, it treated death very casually, which I think was new in the sense that the camera never lingers on the image. You know, the camera just moves along like it's in real time, as if the camera and the and then therefore the eye of the of the audience is indifferent to death. It just happens. And I think the third element that was really radical was that it was such a nihilistic film. There is no justice at the end of this movie. Uh, although the hitchhiker is killed, the rest of the family get away, uh, and the only survivor is Sally, who is so badly damaged uh, emotionally, it's hard to believe she will ever be normal. And there's also this... I mean, you, you do get a feeling of the dynamic between the family members and between the kids, but it's largely devoid of backstory or motivation. Um, but, but you know, you as an actor, when preparing Leatherface, I mean, those are the kinds of things that you have to concern yourself with um, to create that character. Uh, so, 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 yeah. how how did your perception of of Leatherface and his world come about? Well, I was lucky in that. Um... You know, the uh, Toby and Kim, the, the the director and the writer, you know, we met when I was, when they were deciding whether to cast me. And they told me a lot about the, the character's personality and his relationship to the family. So they gave me basically my research. They told me what I needed to know about the character. Um, then I, of course, had to figure out how I was going to present all that. So even though we don't know their backstory other than the fact that they're unemployed slaughterhouse workers. Uh, we get in the audience, we get a very clear picture of the dynamic within the family and the dynamic among the among the victims. So my job was to figure out how to present that character. And the limitations I had were I had not, neither face nor voice. So I really had to rely entirely on my body. So the way I prepared for that was I went to a residential school for retarded persons and spent a couple of days walking around watching uh, the way people moved. I had spent time there before because my mother worked at a clinic there. And uh, so I had been on the campus, you know, now and then. And uh, so I just walked around. It was open campus. People, you know, residents were walking around there. And I just watched the way people moved. And I tried to find some posture or postures and some movements that I felt would work for me and, and find them in these other people. Uh, the, the problem was finding them in a way that made sense. You know, you can, you can sort of acquire a bunch of ticks, but they don't, if they don't work as a whole, they don't mean much of anything. So that's what I did. I spent, spent a couple of days out there. And then finally, um, one, on the second day, one of the staff, there was a couple of staff people walking down the sidewalk. And 
I sort of slipped into this leather face mode to see what would happen. And they walked right past me and looked right through me as if I were just, you know, another resident there. So I felt at that point that maybe I had the character the way I wanted. Yeah. You know, there's something else that, um, that John Landis says in your book that I, I think was terrific. He, he said, you know, you maybe empathize is too strong of a word. It's, it's not so much that you empathize with Leatherface as so much as, you know, you recognize that this isn't one of those serial killers that, that, that kill young people with glee. I mean, he's, he's genuinely worried uh, by what he has to do and, and wondering what the heck is going on when all of these kids start to show up at his house. Yeah. And I think that what's interesting is, you know, uh, Leatherface, although he's unknowable, you know, and I think that's part of why he's so frightening, he's also, he's clearly not merely evil. You know, he's more than just evil. He has some sort of complexity in that he is torn and frightened about doing this, but feels that this is what he must do. And I think this is part of the, why the movie is compelling, is that the audience is drawn into a certain ambiguity, which is normally you you sympathize with the um, with the victims. But in this film, you're also invited to sympathize with the family because you can turn around the normal sort of sense of protagonist-antagonist and say it's the family that's put upon by the, the kids. You know, it's the kids who come in and, and invade the home of the family. And that ambiguity, I think, is part of why people continue to look at this movie now. How do you think the movie is uh, of its time, a, a reflection of the time in which it was made? Boy, that's a hard one because I'm of that time too. I, I, um, I mean, there is the obvious context of, of you know, gas shortage and, and all of that. But, but that, I, I think is just trivial. I, I think the main thing is this country went through a change. <clears throat> We've long since, you know, there was a time when the wilderness was considered very frightening. I mean, I think Henry Thoreau in the 1800s is really among the first to say, you know, in wilderness is the preservation of the world. And so we always have tended to look at civilized life as safe and that going out into the wilderness as extremely dangerous. And as time has passed, our notion of that has become, we who live in the city are terribly afraid of country folk because they, they are the horrible you know, masses. And country folk are dangerous to us. And I think that's what you see in this movie. This movie really represents that kind of fear, which really started to end in the 70s and you know, in, in the late 70s when we started saying, you know, country life is wonderful and urban life is the evil. But, you know, this movie really sees it the other way, which I think is because it was made at the time when that point of view was changing but hadn't changed yet. And I think that ties it very much to the 70s. I was born in 73, so so, so all of the kind of stuff we're talking about, I, I only know through, through reading and uh, – but – also, you're you're in the midst and in the wake of Vietnam. Did that give a different resonance to to a movie where young people are being slaughtered? Well, you know, I think there are the, there are those who feel that this movie is about Vietnam, and I I never really thought of it that way. But I I mean, for myself, but sure, I think that could certainly make sense, and it makes sense also in the larger context that you know I said this is a very nihilistic movie, and I think. By this point, there are a lot of people saying that something like the war was meaningless. You know, just like just like there is no order in this film. You know, that mm. that these people died in the war. And I, you know, I mean, that they died in this war for nothing. Uh, they died in this in that war because they because the United States thought there were large oil fields in in offshore in Vietnam. You know, they talked communism and all that baloney, but that's what was going on. And so I think there is that sense that, you know, a lot of people are dying for no reason. 
And here we go with a horror movie in which a lot of people die for seemingly no reason at all and with no with no justice for them, which is, I think, also the kind of perception. I think America was very disillusioned by the Vietnam War. Certainly by this point, you know, the turnaround started in about 1970 or 71 when, the, when finally most of the people in America started saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And certainly you can look at this this movie as in some ways representing that disillusionment and that, that dark awareness of the world. Well, I think that horror movies are so uh, ideally suited for kind of subversive sociopolitical commentary, even, even if that's not their aim. Uh, it, it, by their very nature, they tend to reflect that. But when you look at the the horror film climate of today, do you, do you think that that genre still has that investment in the world in which we live, or have we lost that? Well, I don't think it's so strong anymore because we go through these cycles, and one of the things that happens, I think, is that right now we're in a period of, of high popularity for horror movies, which means big financial investments by mainstream studios and producers, and that's very cyclical. And the problem is, as films become mainstream, as horror films become mainstream, they no longer have much to say. And I think that's, you know, the big sorrow of it is finally people are willing to put money into horror movies and it's at that point where horror movies stop saying much of anything. Um, And that's why I'm convinced that the next Toby Hooper is going to be some kid who raises a few thousand dollars and makes a movie with with his friends. Uh, Because I don't know that you can change the horror genre or, or, or develop it or let it evolve or say anything really powerful uh, when you're when you're so deeply embedded in the status quo. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, just the most terrifying scene I've ever experienced in a film is your first appearance, uh, and you speak about it in, in great detail in your book. Um, can you just give me a, a, a morsel of what it was like to shoot that particular scene where you kill Kirk? Well, you know, it was funny because that's really my that is my first time on camera. It was my first scene to shoot. So I was so charged up on adrenaline and so excited and keyed up to do it that I was I was really hopping back and forth, you know, off camera there. I was just really moving and edgy and I just was, you know, I was in flight or fight mode, I guess. And uh so I think part of the reason the scene works so well is because I'm moving very quickly. Some people ask me if that scene's been sped up, um, which it has not. And I'm just moving so quickly, and I'm so charged up that, you know, I picked him up. I was supposed to just pick up Kirk, just lift him and drag him out of the shot. But actually what I did was I picked him up and threw him uh, out of the shot, and he actually threw him head first into a wall. And I think that, you know, that shows, that energy shows in that scene. And then of course, I slammed the door. The door weighed nothing. I mean, you know, it was this piece of sheet metal with a, with a very light wooden framework behind it. But because the the way it was constructed, it jammed when I slammed it up against the, the wall. And so it looked like it must have weighed half a ton because it didn't bounce at all. Mm-hmm. And then I think the final element that really makes that such a frightening scene is there's a stinger in the soundtrack right there. This is very deep tone, which is in the same pitch. Uh, I think it's like an octave down from the tone you get from the slamming door. And that that carries right into the next scene when when Pam is out on the out on the swing. And that I think makes it more menacing because you've now carried that menace of the slamming door right out to uh, Pam, who's sitting out in the sunshine. Yeah. Yeah, and of course being followed by that, that, that fantastic tracking shot that's been so revered for many years. I, we, we've spoken to Daniel Pearl several times on the show. He's a favorite guest of ours. And, you know, the, the movie is so overwhelmingly powerful when you first see it that it took me many years to actually recognize the, the, the great artistic value of it uh, in elements like the photography and, and the direction and the story structure. Um, the last question I want to ask you is about uh, meeting the fans, uh, because 40th, the 40th anniversary is around the corner. I'm sure that you're going to be attending conventions and such to, to, with your book and to 
celebrate the legacy of this film. I'm seeing you in Orlando later this month. Um, tell me, uh, what, what does that mean to you? Is that a satisfying experience to you to to, to interact with fans? It really is. It's a great experience. You know, horror fans are so respectful. You know, they're so devoted to the movies and and respectful of the people who work in the movies, you know, in these horror movies, that it's always a pleasure to meet them. And they're also very thoughtful about the movie. Um, I get a lot, of, of course, I get a lot of the same questions because they don't know I've been asked the question before. But almost invariably, someone will ask me a question that, I had not only had not thought of, but uh, really makes me think about the movie in a new way. So I really enjoy, and of course everybody likes to be told how wonderful they are. So, so I really enjoy going to these conventions. In fact, I have to be careful not to go to too many because I, st- you know, I start believing it. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think it's terrific. Well, I, I, can't, I can't wait really- to meet with you later this month, and. and- your book is phenomenal, and we'll 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 sell it hard on our website and during our show. And uh, thank you so much for the the role you've played in my love of movies. It, it's meant a lot to me, so thank you. Well, thanks, Jamie. It was-